Hey, hey, everybody, it's Eddie from Tokyo. This is your cryptocurrency update from Japan. And yesterday, my video was very Japan centric. Today, we're going to skip across the world because there are some interesting headlines that are occurring. And first, today is definitely a day that you want to wear your favorite project on a t-shirt. And I want to highlight to you a brand new design on a jersey by the digital nomad investor. I think it's very bold, it's very fresh, and I will put the link in the description below. All right, this article caught my eye because Wall Street, after they've had a couple of days to digest the story about JP Morgan and their new stablecoin, which is being called a virtual currency, uh, that's debatable. Um, Wall Street analysts throw cold water on the JP Morgan's cryptocurrency, and they're calling it basically an announcement, which is a non-event. Well, I think what really got everybody is that this man, Jamie Dimon, who is, of course, at the head of a very powerful bank, through cold water on the whole entire cryptocurrency space. I mean, it was something when he called Bitcoin a fraud. I think it took everybody aback. And then he had the audacity to continue to diss the cryptocurrency space and then to just come around and come out with his own cryptocurrency for private use among his wholesale clients. It just seems so deceitful, so dishonest. It's just actually disgraceful that a man of his position uh, did what he did. And I do believe that is what got everybody so emotional. Today, there's a new podcast with Jed McCaleb. And I am always very interested when Jed gets uh, interviewed because he's a little elusive. He runs under the radar quite often. And if you're interested in the history of this space. This is a great podcast because Jed got involved when there was only about 200 people talking on the Bitcoin Talk Forum, and he was one of the earliest people to get involved. What attracted him is that Bitcoin was able to solve that double spend uh, problem, and it's very, you know, powerful in in that it was the first to actually do this. So I think you'll enjoy listening to him talk about Stellar and also talk about Mt. Gox. He is really trying to create a universal payment network. He said that it's not just a copy of XRP and that the code is totally different. The visions might be similar, but uh, they are addressing it differently. And when he goes on to talk about Mt. Gox, Mount Gox, it was very interesting. You know, originally the URL was used as a trading platform for game cards, but he reused the URL when he became interested in Bitcoin and it became the very first exchange. And the price at that time was just six cents. So getting fiat on and off is one of the biggest challenges for him because the APIs at the bank, as he calls it, were old and crappy. And in the uh, time that he did have it, the volume started to grow. And after just only about six months, they had 2,000 to 3,000 people using it. It was on track to make about $100,000 a year. He started to hand it over to Mark at that point, And it was trading, Bitcoin was trading for about 25 cents. So uh, he got to know Mark because Mark worked on an integration project to on-ramp Euro at the time. And he is uh, something that, uh, well, he talks about how they did the deal. And basically, he, Mark bought it from Jed, and Jed was to receive some future revenue. But that revenue maybe didn't come all the way like he expected. And in a summary of the entire space, he says, yes, that the innovation is there, but there's still a lot of misappropriation of capital. And we still, it's very, very important to get some real use cases happening. And basically what he's saying is get these projects off the white paper. 
And one of those projects that are off the white paper is Tron, and you just can't help but notice they officially become number one in the decentralized app platforms in the world. So respect to Justin Sun for what he is doing. The most important part is when you look at the active decentralized apps. So Ethereum has 2,133. EOS has 13,845. Tron, according to the uh, Decentralized App Review, a leading DAP ranking site, Tron has 16,236. They are far beyond the nearest uh, site clipping at their heels. So again, you just have to stand up and pay attention to those projects that are actually using uh, the technology and have real case real use cases yeah that's that's really that's really what it is okay and Stephen deep he is so good at aggregating xrp ripple interviews i mean he's the best i don't know how he does it you know i am <laughs> I am searching high and low all the time for things that nobody else can find. And I don't know how he does it, but he is able to find these uh, videos, which have real nuggets when it comes to interviews. And this one is uh, talking about Remitly. Remitly is interesting because they are basically... Um, focusing on a million customers per year they do about six billion and they are providing services to the underserved immigrants of mexico india and the philippines and they are curious about integrating blockchain to drive down their costs and of, of course also speed things up um, he says that something interesting in the interview uh this shifting consumer behavior patterns when it comes to banking services is hard. And I am sure he is correct. So he's paying a lot of attention to Ripple. He's cautious. The P2P to utilize cryptocurrency, uh, you know, is one that he wants to be sure that he doesn't, um, I think, disrupt the trust of his customers. So he remains interested in the payment solutions offered by Ripple, but I think he's um, being very cautious about it. All right, Long Hash. Boy, if you haven't discovered this site, this site is getting more and more interesting all the time. I am not big on technical analysis, as you know. I mean, I, I respect it. I pay attention to it. I watch it. Um, and, but I think that it has its limitations, and I am much more one to focus on um, sentiment and deep learning and stats that uh, are maybe uh, done in a way that is um, provided by uh, AI. So when you go to the long hash site, they have act eight active and live charts that use a combination of deep learning and statistics and as well as market sentiment. And there is something very, very interesting that I think needs to be uh, paid attention to. I'm going to pay, uh, just play 20 seconds of this um, video. Have a listen. Want to know where Bitcoin's price is headed? Surprisingly, one answer might lie in a crypto coin called Tether. Tether, USDT, is a cryptocurrency that's ostensibly pegged to the US dollar, but its value actually fluctuates against the dollar as Tether adds or subtracts tokens from its supply. And there's a strong correlation between those events and the price of Bitcoin. Okay, so I thought, oh, I want to see this chart. And here it is. And it is unbelievably accurate. So it takes us from November 25th up to uh, February 17th. And you can see that truly the Bitcoin price is definitely following just behind the movement and charts of Tether. So possibly... In terms of um, technical analysis, this might be one area that if you're in, into that, then check out this particular chart. As I said, the 
the website itself has eight different active and live charts to look at. All of them are a little bit different. So uh, I will put the link to this website in the description below. Okay. The last headline is kind of interesting. So Norwegian City replacing fiat and cash for its own cryptocurrency. Well, I wanted to go a little deeper into this story because I think that sometimes the headlines just don't, and even the stories themselves as this one, uh, as I read it, really didn't give us the whole entire story. What it is, is it's a, it's a place in Norway, in Southern Norway, near Christ, uh, Christiansand, mm, yeah. And Lieberstad rests only on three parcels of rural land about 150 hectares. So there have been 100 lots, all pre-sold, the lots sold for anywhere uh, ranging from 9,400 to 47,000. And government, no government, it's a private city. It's based on an experiment by Austrian economists from the 20th century. So they are creating a community or a city or a non-government a uh, private city where it will provide services without government and no fiat allowed. Here is actually what that location in Norway looks like right now. It looks very cold. It looks very, very, very cold. Yeah, so if you are interested, they are going to expand in the near future and i think there are uh for the people who bought the lots more than 33 different nationalities make up the ownership very interesting don't you think but i don't know i don't know if this is my kind of place i'm i'm not very good in extreme temperatures okay so i am going to go to the fluff now which talks about cold extreme temperatures. This is the Japanese snow monkey. And it is, uh, yeah, they are very, very um, popular when it comes to tourists, not only from other countries, but even within Japan. And they are most active in the Nagano region where they uh, frequent a hot spring to stay warm in the winter. So from about December to March, you can go visit them and it's uh, you can get up very close and personal to them. Let me just tell you a little bit about these monkeys. So they are excellent swimmers. They live farther north than any other non-human primate. They love the hot springs. They can live to be about 30 years old. They'll eat anything and they have unique and distinct class systems, meaning the younger siblings dominate the older ones. Wow. And they do play. So they'll play with rocks or they'll play with, uh, they, they're very, very, very smart. They wash their food before they eat and each group has their own unique culture. And when you go on a tour, yeah, you can see here, this is how uh, close you can get to the monkeys. They are totally not phased by the tourist at all. They completely ignore or, or if they don't ignore, they will take your smartphone. <laughs> this is a real picture. There is a um, professional nature photographer from the Netherlands. His name is Marcel van Osten, and he took this photograph. By the way, I'm going to put a link to his website because his photographs are phenomenal. He doesn't use flash. He uses more of the natural light, which creates the most amazing images. And his um, photographs of these monkeys are just really uh, fabulous. So I wanted to know, he talks about the story behind this photograph. And sure enough, there was a woman who was taking selfies and she kept getting closer and closer and closer uh, to the monkeys as she was taking a selfie. And this monkey took her phone out of her hand and went out to the middle of the hot spring and began to play on it. It's so funny, huh? 
<laughs> All right, everybody. I hope you can come to Japan and see the Japanese snow monkeys. We will talk to you soon. Sayonara for now. Bye bye.